Welcome to another episode of the Understanding Ultra podcast, the podcast that likes to ask the question, why? We aim to give you the insights from the top ultra runners and trail runners from around the world, the people that work in the trail industry and everybody else. We dive into training, nutrition, mindset and racing strategies to help you to become the best ultra runner that you can be. So without further ado, let's speak to our next guest. Okay, we're live. Okay, so Mike McKnight, welcome to Understanding Ultra. Appreciate you uh, spending some time with us. Uh, I say this evening, it's this evening here, but it's it's your morning over there. How, how are things with you? Great. Just got done with my run and my working out and stuff and just getting ready to start the day. <laughs> yeah, I noticed uh, I was looking at Instagram earlier and I saw that you had was it seven, seven miles you've been this morning. Mm-hmm. Working, yeah. working on your left heart rate. Yep, yep, slowing it down a little bit. Yeah, I noticed that you, you like it was, it was, it was sort of up there, and then there was a, quite a rapid descent. Did you, did you stop, or did, have you learned to be able to just drop your heart rate quickly? Um, what you're probably seeing is where I turned around and started running downhill. All right, yeah. So yeah, I just lowered quite a bit for the downhill section. <laughs> Bit, bit easier yeah it's nice the downhills make the most of the down where you got them yeah brilliant okay so for the people that um that you know most people that will be listening to this podcast or watching this video on youtube will will know who you are and that's why you're watching this video um i think it's safe to say that you've um you've made a name for yourself in the in the ultra world as far as the really really long ultras are concerned so You've got like the 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 Moab two forty, the Tahoe two hundred, the Bigfoot two hundred. Most people think that us ultra runners are crazy, anyways. Why? What attracts you to these like ridiculously long ultras? Uh, I just like all the different elements that you have to prepare yourself for for these longer ones. Um, I mean. Honestly, I'm not that fast. <laughs> like if you, if I did a 50K or something like that, I'm not going to do that well. Um, I've had okay times with 50Ks, but it's just a lot more inconsistent. And um, yeah, but I, I like all the different things that you have to prepare yourself for, for the 200s, the, the consistency, the, you know, you have to do a lot of strength training and preparation for it to make sure that you like last and you don't, injure yourself or how long you're going to be out there and I like the sleep deprivation and trying to figure out how to sleep just enough to not go crazy but not too much that you're going to jeopardize your overall time so it's just it's just a fun strategic distance that I really enjoy participating in. Mm. There's, a, there's a lot of prep that goes into long ultras because once you've kind of gone into the realms of ultras and anything like from like a 50k upwards being an ultra you, you, I suppose you can when you've done enough you can kind of wing the shorter races can't you the sort of the 50ks and up to 50 miles you can get away with it but um, you know with like less training and less planning but when it comes to a big race like that where you like 200 miles plus you've got to really you've got to really plan for it haven't you? you've got to get and it's that part of the fun like the the planning and the looking at routes and planning all of your nutrition and all of your, the way you get to stop and everything like that. Do you, do you find fun joy in that or is it, is it a bit of hard work to do that? It's hard work, but I don't do it a lot. Um, <laughs> I'm, pre I'm pretty unprepared when it comes to those things. Um, I, I find the more I prepare, the more it stresses me out and the more I overthink it and the worse I end up doing. So I just try to get a basic understanding of things like, um, I mean, I don't even know what I try to get an understanding of, honestly, like, I just kind of wing it. I, like, you know, at the Moab 240, I didn't really know how far apart the aid stations were. I've done the race three times, um, but I still forget the name of aid stations and forget how far apart they are. So, like, usually I just come into the aid station and say, hey, how far to the next aid station? And then they'll tell me and then I'll just grab as much water and food as I need in that moment and take off. 
um, where like, uh, <clears throat> like three or four years ago when I did my first 200, I like over planned it a lot. Um, and it took a lot of time and it stressed me out. And like, I just found that I never, like nothing really went according to plan. Um, like for drop bags, for example, like I'd plan where I would need a certain thing at a drop bag and I'd get to that aid station either way early or way late and it just didn't help me. So I just don't really plan anymore and just kind of show up and do it and figure it out as I go along the right way. You think that's like part of your success is probably not sweating the, the details and just going with the feel of the race then, do you think? I think so, because I've noticed a noticeable improvement in my times and stuff ever since I've started doing that, because I used to be like an over planner and my times and stuff were a lot more inconsistent. So I think that's part of the reason that it's helped out quite a bit. Yeah, I think yeah, so. I mean, like, stress, stress affects you. Like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I learned that so it was in 2019, I was um, me and my wife were moving from Utah to Colorado for work and just like that whole year was just super stressful because I was trying to decide it was, it was for a job that I had um, we got bought and relocated and so there's like a three-month period where I was trying to decide if I wanted to keep the job or if I wanted to stay in Utah because this is where I grew up um, so just like the stress of trying to figure that out and then once we did decide to move the stress of trying to sell our current house um, and then trying to buy a house that we hadn't even really even seen. Like we just had to rely on what our realtor was telling us. Like um, I remember I did Western States uh, and then like the night before Western States, we put an offer on a house. Um, and so just like waking up the next morning on race day, I was just stressed out trying to figure out, cause you know, when you put an offer in on a house, especially in, in Denver, you, um, you have a lot of competitive um a lot of other competitive buyers out there. So you usually have like a short window to, if they accept your offer to like proceed and move forward. So I was just worried about getting an accepted offer while I was out racing and just like carrying all that weight. Like I ended up having a terrible race and um, just like all my training runs and preparation for that never really felt on. I just had like higher heart rate and I was not putting, going as fast as usual. So I just learned that stress, um, you know, it's a common understanding that stress affects you, um, especially like with training and stuff, like it affects your sleep, it, it could affect your heart rate and stuff. So ever since then, I've just tried, tried to make it a point to not stress out too much. And part of that for me is just not thinking too much about all those little details and races. And it's, it's helped out a lot. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, and I'm currently, this is a question I've got for you, for my own personal um justification this week I'll, i'm racing this weekend i've got a two-day uh, stage race and i'm horrific at tapering what are you what are you like at tapering because i i spend like two weeks stressing and i know every single time i do it i know that i'll expect to feel like i'm getting ill i'll expect to feel like there's something wrong with my legs and feel like i'm getting flu or getting a cold or getting covid which is the latest thing to stress about stress about how do you do you just not stress anymore about, about races and, and in, the in the taper period or you just, uh, how do you feel? Do you still get nervous? Do you still worry about things? No, not really. Um, like I have just accepted that the taper is, like, I, I think it's common for all of us when we start tapering, we start noticing like issues and, um, you know, like our, our thigh might hurt all of a sudden or we might get some random pain in our foot um typically like our heart rate goes up more like like every time it's just like you know you're doing a short and easier run but your heart rate is still high and in your head you're just like well that shouldn't be like that shouldn't have it shouldn't be that way like like I should be feeling fresh I should be having a lower heart rate and um it, it's easy to stress about all that but that's just that's just what's happening with your body like everybody goes through it so there's no point in stressing about it like most of the time, at least in my experience, like even if the taper feels off, like come race day, like everything just resolves and you're able to, to go after it. So, you know, half the things we stress about are things that are out of our control. So, you know, tapering is good for us. It's, it's going to help us feel fresh on race day. And just because some stuff happens, 
you know, doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to resolve it come race day. So there's no point in stressing about it. Yeah, good advice. So for everybody watching, be like Mike and don't stress. Be chill. Be chill. It's hard. It's hard. But um, I mean, I'm not perfect at it, but I've gotten a lot better at it. And I've noticed a lot of, a lot practice. of, mental, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of practice. That did. Yeah. And one, one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on, obviously, I want to get you on like as, as soon as I could after your, you know, your, your recent um, victory. Um, but I think um, one of what is it that attracts you to that race in particular? It's the um, it was a Moab one wanted the Moab 240, and that's the the bigger one of the of the three out of the sort of the Grand Slam. What um, what what is it that you love so much about about that race? Um, I, mean, I mean, honestly, out of the three, that's my least favorite. <laughs> <laughs> it's just. Um, so usually, so I like every time I've done the 200s, I've done it a part of the Triple Crown, mm. and Moab is just like a part of it. Um, this year, though, Tahoe was canceled, so I didn't end up doing the Triple Crown. I only did Bigfoot and Moab. Um, what you might be referring to, though, like earlier in the year, I was originally planning on just doing Moab um, and not doing the Triple, but as we got closer, I, I started a little bit of FOMO, so I signed up for the other two. <laughs> but um, I've just like you know the first year I did it was the year Courtney DeWalter did it and she um and she set a solid time it was 57 and 50 ish minutes 57 hours and 50 ish minutes she, she set the course record and um, I went back two years later and did the triple crown again and I was on target to get really close to her course record but then I got lost for a couple hours and so between getting lost and then between doing Moab as a part of the triple, um, like in my head, I was like, like if I, if I show up to Moab fairly fresh, um, I think I could set a, a pretty good course record there. So the start of this year, that was my intent. I just like, I just wanted to go to Moab fresh, not a part of the triple, see if I could go after Courtney's course record and, and put a good space between whatever I ended up doing and her record. Um, so yeah, I, I just I just wanted to do Moab for that reason, just to like go after the course record and do it fresh. But um, in reality, out of the three, it's my least favorite. Um, Tahoe's Tahoe's definitely my favorite. So I'm I'm really sad that it was canceled this year. Yeah, why why was it canceled? Uh, there was a really big fire that started, and it was, um, I mean, the fire reached the course and. It was just too dangerous, too too high of smoke levels in the air, and it was just unhealthy and not good. Yeah, wise decision to cancel it then. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. um, so when I I first heard of you, because I've been a, a long time follower of uh, Jeff Brown in Go mm. Wrong Billy, and yeah. uh, I heard of you, uh, he he sort of posted about you and was saying how um, you were doing the the hundred miler on on zero carbs and. And with myself uh, having a, a, a keen interest in that, uh, myself, I've been low carb off, uh, well, not off and on low carb since probably about this would be my fourth year, something like that, of low carb, and made a massive difference for me. And because of that, I got into the whole world of all, all of the ultra runners that are all low carb. So as soon as Jeff mentions you, my ear sort of pricks up straight away. And, and to hear that you've done a uh, hundred miler on zero carbs is just, is just amazing. What, what made you decide to do that? Was that just purely to test yourself and your own abilities and see how far you can push it or is there some other reason? Yeah. Um, so, so the goal, so the goal is to do a hundred miles without consuming any calories. So not just carbs, but also calories. Um, and the reason being is when I started the low carb approach, I, uh, I don't know if you've done any research or read any of the research that Dr. Jeff Volokh has put out or if you've yeah. heard of that. Name. Yeah. So I remember that a few times um, in some of the videos I watched on YouTube about him, um, he mentioned how like even the thinnest person in the world has enough fat storage to, if they were put in a position where they needed to rely on their fat storage and not eat any food that they have enough fat to last for like a few days 
and he was like trying to to show that like how big our fat storage is and I'm sure he gets asked all the time, like, well, I'm, I'm so skinny, so I can't have that much fat to, to burn. So he's just trying to point out that everybody has enough fat to burn for quite a while. So every time I heard that, I, I was always wondering in my head, like, because obviously when he would talk about that, he was referring to somebody that was in a pretty, like, like a, a sedated state, wasn't doing a lot of activity. Um, so I was wondering how that would correlate to somebody that was like actually working out um like like if we had enough fat storage to last us for a few days if we weren't doing anything how long could our fat storage last us in like a, a physically act active state like if we were running uh because i i had done a lot of fasted running um before this 100 miler like the furthest i had done was a 32 miler without any cal calories like just a training run and like the reason i would do that is just because i felt better um, like I, I found that I have, I, I just don't do good at digesting food when I'm running. So I would just like start pushing that threshold and see like how much of my training I could do without eating food. And so like, just, I was just wondering how far, like I could actually go without eating calories and with COVID happening and races canceling and like no focus in 2020. Um, I decided just to make my own hundred mile route and see if I could do hundred miles without eating any calories. Um, and since it was so unknown to me, like I got, as far as I know, and this is, as far as I know to this day, aside from when I did it, there's no data out there of anybody else that's done it. And so at the time, like I didn't have anything to look at. Like I didn't know how dangerous it was. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I just planned like a a route here in the area that I live that I would be like no further away from a hospital than like 30 minutes. Um, I had somebody pacing me every step of the way. Um, my wife came a few times in the car to check on me. Like I, I did, I did it as best as I could to make it safe since I had no idea what would happen. And um, I mean, it just it ended up, I, everybody that asked me about this, like I always just say it ended up turning out pretty uneventful. Like, in a good way, uh, no issues, no, no bonks. And I know that's like a funny word over where you're at as well. And, but... and it, it gets that used, that word is used a lot with cycling in Europe. So using okay. the word, yeah, that's, yeah, it's fine. But yeah, obviously it does have other meanings over here. Yeah. But we know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So like I had no issues and, um, I didn't have any food cravings. I didn't like lose a lot of energy. The only thing that I did notice, though, is roughly around mile, like between 60 and 70, um, which in a 100 mile race is when I typically like try to like pick it up and finish strong. Um, I just noticed that I couldn't pick it up. That I was just kind of stuck in this gear. Um, and if I wanted to try to run faster, I couldn't. So, I mean, that was like the only thing I noticed that calories, carbs, whatever would have been beneficial at that point of the journey. But I mean, overall, it was just just pretty uneventful, and it was something I was able to figure out as possible. Mm. So has, has it informed your training and, and race day nutrition with what you learned from that, or is it was it just a, an experiment that you've done and you you don't really you know that it it worked and you can't take any more from it than you already have, or have you learned from it? So, so I mean, a couple of things with that question, like the first thing is I learned that I can just trust myself in a race, like eat when I feel I need some, like a boost. Um, whereas in the past, like, you know, like the appeal to a low carb approach is that you don't have to eat as much per hour when you're racing and you still should have some, some good energy. Um, but even like with that knowledge, like in my head before this experiment, like you know, every hour or so I'd be like, oh, I haven't eaten yet. I should probably get like at least a hundred calories in me right now. Um, whereas now I'm just like, you know, I don't do that. Like I just truly like eat when I feel I could use a boost um, versus like forcing it just because somebody told me that I should try to eat every hour. Um, and then the other thing too, is just like, I don't know if you saw, I'm going to do it again next month. Yeah. At a race. Um, so, I mean, this was just when I did it a year ago, it was just purely like seeing if it was possible, but I didn't do any data, any data, like any research on it. So, so now like, I'm really interested to see what's actually happening in the body and 
collecting some data and stuff like that. So I feel like there's still a lot I can learn from it aside from just like the few stuff that I, I learned so far. And it's in a race scenario as well. So how do you, how do you think you'll, do you think you'll be get to that point again in the 60, 70 mark and your competitive edge will make you think, should I be having some <laughs> take now to, to win this or how do you think you're going to feel? Are you going to stick to I'm not going to race if that's what you're asking. Um, I'm just, I'm just doing it at a race. Um, one, it's across the years. So it's like a nice, it's a nice flat course. You, it's just like a mile loop. So like, I'll always be around people and it's going to be easy to test there. Um, like I'm going to have a crew coming out that's going to do some testing and, you know, versus doing my own route where they're going to have to follow me and meet me in a car and stuff like that. They can just kind of sit at base camp and it's going to be easier for them. Um, the only thing I am going to try to do though, is I, like, I, I would think it'd be cool to get a, my 24 hour best at this event. Um, so I'm doing the 24 hour event, and, um, you know, the main goal is just to like keep it consistent and not blow up and, get some good data but you know in my head too I'm going to still try to get a 24-hour best for myself but I'm not going for like I'm not going to race and try to get first place or anything like that <laughs> well what are you like um com what's your competitive streak like because um I know I you know I I'm always saying my wife is very competitive and and she'll be literally competitive you play a board game and she'll you know she'll want to <laughs> halfway through because she's so competitive and, and I say I'm not competitive I'm only competitive with myself but when you're in a race scenario and you think that you've got a chance to to be winning a race do you, do you think that that might take over or are you just absolutely like completely sure if you plan on the day and you're just gonna just keep it super chill and and get the data so usually like that probably would take over but I don't think it will for a couple of reasons um one is like, I really want to get this data and I don't want to botch anything. So like, I'm truly just going there to get some good data and, and push my own self by trying to get my own personal best. Uh, but the other thing too, is like, it's kind of hard to race at this event because the way they have it set up. Um, so like they have a 10 day event. I don't know if you've heard of across the years. Yeah, well, I've, heard, I've just heard that it's, is it to do with your age and, and it's like a, hand, is it like a handicap race where you get different distances or something? Start yeah, there's, so there's, so every day, so I mean, so there's a 10 day race, there's a six day race, there's like a 48 mile or, or sorry, 48 hour, 24 hour, 100 mile, 200 mile, last man standing, like there's a, a there's a variety of different races. Um, but the thing is, is like, since it's over a period of 10 days since the longest event is 10 days if you're doing a shorter distance um you can pick which day you're starting so i'm doing the 24 hour i'm starting december 30th there's still going to be a handful of other racers doing the 24 hour that's going to start different days so, i mean like like even like the group that i'm going to start with on the 30th like even like if i beat all every single one of them that doesn't mean that somebody another day is going to go faster than me so I feel yeah. like that's going to take the competitive side out of me a little bit down because like, you're not going to know until 10 days later if you won or whatnot. So I, th I think I should be good. Yeah. That, that makes a lot more sense now. Yeah. I suppose if, yeah, it's the fact that you're not all together on one day doing a race that, yeah, that takes that competitive edge away yeah. from it. Brilliant. Um, so as far as we at the start, I was supposed to ask you about you, 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 your background before you came to running so one of the things that i want to achieve with this podcast is the you know why it's called understanding ultra is the is to ask the question why so what is your and it's obviously a big question what is the and i think i know part of the answer because i've you know i've seen loads of loads of your videos and how you got into running but what's your why for for ultra running and why how did you get into ultra running and why is it so important to you yeah, so I started ultra running in 2013, um, and then roughly two years before that, I started running just to get in shape. Uh, running didn't have too much of like I didn't have too much of a background in running before that. I did I did start running in um, junior high to lose weight, 
Uh, but once I lost the, the weight, I kind of stopped. Uh, but then I turned 21. I started running to get in shape. Um, I had this like goal to get fast enough to walk on to the track team that I, uh, of the college that I was attending. Uh, mostly just because I want, <coughs> mostly just because I wanted to try to get my, my tuition paid for and get like a scholarship. <clears throat> Um, that was kind of like one way that I was going to try to save money is get fast enough that they would give me money. Um, so I started training pretty consistently. And then shortly after that, I was in a skiing accident. Uh, most people have heard this story. I broke my back at a, at a ski resort, had surgery the next day. Doctor told me that I would be in bed for months and that I shouldn't try running for about a year. Um, so because of that prognosis, I incompleted my college classes for a full year, um, meaning that I like just kind of deferred them for a year and I'd pick up a year later. Uh, I lost my job. I got a job like a week or two before I broke my back. And when they heard I'd be just gone for months, um, they, they booted me. <laughs> um, and then long story short, six weeks later, I started running just to see if it was possible, just to see how much my back would hurt. Um, I discovered that my back didn't hurt any worse or any less than it was hurting just like sitting at home. So, you know, until like I started noticing pain, like higher up on the scale, like I took that as a sign that I could just start running. So I started running a little bit every day, like half a mile to a mile, mile to a mile and a half. And about two months post-surgery, I ran a 10K, um, no issues. And so... I actually ran that 10K in, they made this like full body, not full body, full torso, like plastic, like molded brace for my body. Um, so I ran the 10K in that, I got a lot of funny looks. Um, the funny, but but after that 10K, I was like, it's like my back feels fine, but like, holy cow, I cannot, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> like, it was just like, I couldn't get my chest to breathe out because of how tight that that brace was. And so it was after that 10K that I like, um, and, and you know, in retrospect, this, this could have been a stupid decision, but like, I was like, okay, I'm going to try to run without my brace now, um, just like, cause I just want to be able to breathe. So I took the brace off. I went for a short run the next day. Um, like I didn't feel pain. Like I didn't feel any extra pain, but like, it's like weird to describe, like I could feel like the extra hardware in my back. It felt heavy. It just felt super weird. Um, so I proceeded with caution. Like I, I'd throw my brace on, do a run the next day with the brace, take the brace off and do the, my next one without the brace. And started to find that like nothing bad was happening. So I just kind of ditched the brace. And this was about two and a half, three months post-surgery. Um, and before I knew it, like so I had surgery in February, um, before I knew it, like come May, you know, all my friends were in college. I didn't have a job. I wasn't in college. I had nothing to do. So come May, I was running 10 plus miles a day. Um, I was going to the gym, lifting weights, like just really, this is where my like passion for physical activity, like kind of took off because like one, I had nothing else to do. Uh, but two, and this is kind of a back step, but like the week after I broke my back, like I was super bitter, super upset. Like, you know, this 21 year old college student that had to move in with his parents and like life changed. Like, you know, I was very upset, but I, there was a, there was a girl on the Utah state track team, Utah state's the college I was at. Um, there was a, there was a girl on the track team who fell rock climbing. And this is like a week or week and a half after my accident. And she broke her back, but the difference was is she um, she was permanently paralyzed from it. And so when I read that story and realized that I wasn't going to be paralyzed, like that kind of shifted my mindset and I wasn't so bitter anymore. But um, like a big reason that I got started running a lot and continue to run a lot is, you know, it, it's easy to be, it's easy to take things for granted. So, you know, had that experience not happened, who knows how passionate I would be about running right now. Like, I think it's easy to just sit down all the time and watch TV and just get super lazy and like take for granted that you have the ability to move. And so because I was put in that situation where like, 
you know, there was a time before I saw the doctor, like where I wondered if I was going to be paralyzed. Um, the doctor told me that the way I landed and broke my back, that, that my vertebrae burst like hundred percent away from my spinal column. And if I just landed a little bit differently and it compressed a little bit differently and burst inward, that it would have paralyzed me. So just like being in that position where like, I might not be walking right now, um, like really put things into perspective for me that like being able to run 200 miles is like a blessing that a lot of people don't have. So as long as my body keeps responding well to it and, um, you know, I'm going to keep doing it because who knows when I won't be able to do it. Yeah. It's a great story. And I, I can't believe that you six weeks after having spinal surgery, you were, you were out running. Um, what do you think you, you, did your doctors know about this? Did you, did you sort of hide it from them? No, I, like all my checkups and stuff, he just kept making the comment about like how amazed he was at how fast it was recovering. And I, I never told him that I was running. Um, I did, I went to all my appointments with my back brace on. Um, I never told him that I was taking it off as soon as I walked out. Um, <laughs> yeah, like a singlet on underneath your brace. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The cool thing though is um, this is roughly three or four years ago. And I don't know if this, so I, I received like a letter in the mail from a chiropractor. <clears throat> I mean, it was basically like this new guy in town that was starting a practice and he invited us to come to a dinner where he was going to pay for dinner and kind of do his spiel. Um, and it's really funny because me and my wife went to it. This is like shortly after we were married. So we're like, yeah, we'll take a free meal. Um, so we showed up and it was like me and her, you know, in our 20s. And then it was full of a room of people and they're like 60s to 80s. So I think that this guy, like, I don't know, I don't know how he got my name and why he sent it to me. Like, I don't know if there's like a record out there of like back surgeries and stuff like that, that he got access to, but you know, it was a bunch of like people and they're, you know, great. Yeah. 60s to 80s. And then us, but he, he did this spiel. And then after I went and talked to him and told him my story about how I broke my back and how I was an ultra marathoner <clears throat> and, um, he was like, he was super intrigued and he, he offered to do a visit with me for free. Um, I think in his head that he was expecting to find a lot of damage and that by doing this free visit, he was going to like hook me and say, Oh, I need to see you. And we, we have a lot yeah. of work to do on you. So I went in and got x-rayed and, um, you know, I, as soon as he got the x-rays back, he, he told me, he was like, Hey, like, I thought this is going to be terrible, but like your back's like basically perfect and there's nothing I can do for you. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it. So, so it was fun to get those results and see that things are, things are normal. Like I, I had a good surgeon. It, it worked out really, really well for me. Yeah. Wow. Well, you, yeah. You're very fortunate, aren't you? To, to, um, to have made such a, such a good recovery. And that's true actually that you, I think, to think about it being taken away from you, something being taken off you, and then you realizing that, you know, that could have been you, that it could have been you that, that was paralyzed. Um, it's quite a sobering thought, especially when you think of all the the joy that you get from from running, which, well, I mean, you know, that's why we do it. We wouldn't do it if we didn't enjoy it. There's no point yeah. in doing it if you don't. And so the, um, that's always been my, you know, my fear, as I'm sure is probably still your fear of not being able to run. And how, uh, how does that kind of give you mental stability? Do you, because I got into running many years ago um, to kind of just improve my mental health and, and it kind of escalated from there and just then my addictive personality then started moving my way up in the distances and doing further and further races. <laughs> But initially, it was just to kind of sort my my mental health out and and sort a bit of anxiety and depression out. Do you do you have that connection to running as well, or is it just purely you know you recovery from your your back injury and that's why you love running? Or do you does it is there something more to it than that with you with your mental health as well? Um, I mean, I notice like like I've had maybe two to three like injuries in my like career where it put me out for a few weeks and I, I definitely noticed during those few weeks that like I felt more tired and lethargic and like you know 
wished I was out running and more irritable, but like, um, like, like I, I know that I, there's a lot of people who do running because like, you know, they suffer with depression and anxiety and that <clears throat> running like helps with that. Um, so I, I don't feel like I'm in that situation where like I would get depressed if I wouldn't be able to run again. Um, I, I feel like I would be able to adapt and find something else that, that I, I love to do. Um, but like, yeah, it's, I definitely feel better when I run and like, it, it sucks when you're injured or it's, it sucks when you're recovering and you're not be able to, you're not able to do as much, but you know, the, there's definitely a lot more in my life that I'm, I love doing and, um, I'm able to do that more and make it better for me. So especially when you're a, you're, you're a dad as well, uh, like me, I've, I've got two daughters uh, <laughs> turning into teenagers, making me feel old. Uh, <laughs> So you've got um is it just, just one boy isn't it Killian I have a boy and a girl now oh you girl right okay yeah yeah so, so how has being um being a dad changed you as a runner has it changed you as a runner in any way um how has being a dad changed me as a runner I mean a lot of what I do I think about them um like that 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 video that was done on me for the Colorado Trail yeah, I, I, I love having that to let them see when they get older, um, especially like Killian, because he's in it a fair amount. So it's going to be fun to show him that he is a part of it and just kind of hopefully get him like indoctrinated into this sport. And, you know, it'd, it'd be cool to have him like pace me one day and stuff like that. Um, that is one thing I do like about tapering and recovering. And I wish that I would make more time for this when I'm not tapering and recovering, but like, you know, like my day is so busy. So like, usually it's just like, you know, wake up, start strength training, get my run done, come back and shower. And then I got phone calls, uh, some podcasts. Um, so like, I just, I had my day planned out pretty like cutting it. And it's like, when I'm tapering though, like, you know, I usually wake up at the same time every day, if I'm tapering or not tapering, like I just naturally wake up. So it's like, when I'm tapering and recovering, I'm not running as much. I get home and Killian's like, hey, can I go for a run? And so when I'm tapering and recovering, me and Killian can go for like a, like the most we've ever done together is a mile. And like, that's, that's, that's awesome. But now like when I'm like training high, like I get home and like, I just run straight to the shower and change and get ready for my day. So it'd be cool to start making more time for that. But, um, I don't even know if that answers your question or not, but it... yeah, I mean, um, I because I always had that hope, even though I've got daughters, and I thought they'd be less inclined to be to be runners than boys. Um, I kind of just held out hope that the, that one of them would, you know, want to be a runner, and I've not pushed it at all. But then my oldest uh, Tilly, she's just gone up to senior school, so she's so she's like eleven, just gone up to big school. And uh, within the first week, the, she came home with a, a cross-country form to fill out for us. And, you know, unbeknown to us that they, they even did cross-country in the first year that they got to high school. And she was like, I really want to do it. I'm like, you sure? Is this what you want to do? Yeah, 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 that's what I want to do. And I want to go for a training run. I need to go for a training run now. Take me for a training run. So I was like, felt yeah. like all of my Christmases have come at once. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, so, yeah, so we went out and we you know been training she's been doing races and and i've been going to see her and trying to hold back you know shouting across the field to her but yeah uh, yeah so, so maybe yeah maybe in, in years to come it's that's one of the one of the joys of being a parent isn't it seeing your senior kids grow up and you start to see the traits personality traits in them that you have and you and you and, and i do worry when i see some personality traits coming out in them that i've got <laughs> But in, in, you know, in, in, on the other hand, there's uh, there's some good traits in there. Hopefully, yeah. So, yeah, being a dad, it, it never ends, does it? It's always a, uh, it's always uh, it's always busy, always hard work. It is. It's fun. The, so your your childhood, then, um, am I right in thinking that you grew up um, similar to um, Jeff Browning in a in a farming background? Mm -hmm. yeah, how, yeah. How did how did that um, how did that set you up for, for being an ultra runner? 
Yeah. So, I mean, so it's funny because like being a farmer is a, it's a lot of hard work. Um, like whenever I tell my story, I always talk about how like I grew up inactive, like not running, not doing any kind of sports, like lazy and stuff. But I mean, in reality, like I was out doing a lot of hard work. Um, but like <clears throat> I, I gained weight, got heavy, like, um, like everybody that I talk to about low carb that tells me like, oh, I can't do that. There's this one food I can't give up. Like you don't understand. And it's like, like if only you had a glimpse into like what my diet used to be like, <laughs> um, <laughs> like, you know, biscuits and gravy every morning when I was a kid, ice cream every night before bed, lots of like goldfish and marshmallows and Skittles. Like um, whenever I did have some fat, it was, it was in, it was paired with a lot of carbs, um, which is why I gained weight because my body was storing all that excess fast fat and trying to burn all the carbs I was eating. So it was just kind of a bad combination. Um, and I guess this is a tangent to your question. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, so the thing with farming that has helped me today, like I'm convinced that, that growing up on a dairy farm has, has helped me with these 200 mile races uh, one, just because like, you know, I grew up with the, the mentality of like needing to put in work and working hard. Um, like for, for those who don't know what a dairy farm schedule is like, like, you know, every other day I was getting up at 2 a.m. to milk the cows and because the cows, they have to be milked every day. But fortunately, I had cousins that helped too and stuff. So usually every other day I was up at 2 a.m. milking the cows from 2 to 5, 2 to 5.30 um during the school year would need to go to school um on that little sleep and then when I got back from school like the cows were milked two times a day so I'd go right back to usually they would start milking the cows without me but I'd go back and like feed the calves or whatever or clean up the barn um but like in the summer it was get up at two milk the cows till 5 30 go home and sleep till 6 30 then get back up and move the pipe um after you're done moving the pipe, go cut the hay, uh, <laughs> bell the hay, load the trucks, move the hay to the field, like to the to the farm, and then go right back to milking the cows. And when you're done milking the cows, go move the pipe. So like usually it was like 2 a.m. to to 8 p.m. every day in the summer. Summers were rough. Um, so like you know, I just grew up functioning off of like four hours of sleep a night um, in the summer, just because that's how much time we had to sleep. And so, you know, fast forward to today, like all these races that, <clears throat> that I'm doing that are multi-day, like, you know, like I'm, I'm just used to doing stuff like physically active stuff for a long period of time with a little bit of sleep in between. Obviously, like that's heightened at a 200 mile race because I'm like only sleeping for five or 10 minutes versus four or five hours. But like the, the concept's the same, like because I had the opportunity to grow up doing a lot off of a little sleep. I feel like that's just something I'm used to still. I set you up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> it's no wonder you felt like you needed some comfort food at the end of the day. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they were, um, my, my wife comes from, um, from a farming uh, family and her grandparents, they, they were dairy farmers as well. And I'd heard the stories about, you know, being up and, you know, before everybody else has got up, He's got up and, and um, milked all the cows and he's come in and then he's had his traditional English breakfast of uh, bacon and eggs. And, uh, and that's why he's still alive now at like nearly 90 years old and fighting COVID off and, and all this other stuff. He's still, I'm sure that's the thing that's, that's kept him going all these years. The fact that he worked hard and had proper food, <laughs> real food, and stayed away yeah. from processed food. I'm sure that's the, the secret to his it's a uh, long, long longevity. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forget sometimes my dad is, my dad is almost 72 and I forget that sometimes just because he's like, still acts so, like he's really, still acts like he's way young and moves around a lot. And like they sold the dairy cows, but they still do crops. So he's still pretty busy in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's definitely <laughs> hard. It? And shout out to all the farmers out there that, uh, that keeping keeping all the keeping the world going not not just american uh, and the uk okay right so i've got a couple of questions just from um people that have asked uh, wanted to ask you some questions 
So uh, Gary has asked, um, where, where do your thoughts go when things get really difficult? Do you let your mind wander or do you have a mental skills strategy that you use? So when you're in the, you know, in the thick of it in an ultra, how do you cope? So, I mean, if things get really, really difficult, um, I go, I'll listen to music. Um, <clears throat> my, I have tattooed on my arm, just one step forward. Uh, when I was about to drop at a race in 2017, my, my wife wrote that on my arm. Um, and so I looked at that quite regularly throughout that race and then later got tattooed. So if things get super tough, like I'll, I'll have to repeat that in my head quite a bit. Um, look at the race as like aid station to aid station versus like looking at the grand scheme of things. Like <clears throat> if you're at mile 60 at the Moab 240 and you're hurting, like it's pretty daunting to realize you still have 180 miles to go. <laughs> Um, but it's quite a bit easier if you just like, okay, it's only 18 miles to the next aid station. I'll be there in five hours. Like anybody can move for five hours at a slow pace if they need to. Um, so those are the two things that I'll do if things get really difficult, but, um, I've just, I'm good at just zoning out. Like there's, there's, I, I think the, the ability to zone out is something that's pretty key in these races. Um, like I'll, I'll turn my watch. <clears throat> so like when I'm training, I have like my mileage, my pace and all that stuff on my watch that I have access to. But when I'm in these races, I make sure I don't see those screens. Um, like I'll just put it on my heart rate or I'll put it on the time of day or whatever. Um, so it's like, I just put my head down, I zone out. And before I know it, like I'm already at the next aid station because I wasn't constantly looking at my, my watch. So, mm -hmm. so you definitely got to have your mantras and your ways to, to keep moving. Um, but I think the ability to zone out is like pretty, a, a pretty good skill to try to develop. Um, and then to the other thing, I don't know if you saw that post I did about my wife a few weeks ago. Um, you got to have a solid crew at these races. Um, <clears throat> you know, at Moab, I was going through a lot of back pain and I was, I made up my mind that I was going to quit. And I told my wife, um, this was like mile 70, 70 ish. Um, it was a crewable aid station. <clears throat> the next crewable aid station wasn't for another 50 miles. So I, I knew I wasn't going to see Sarah for another 50 miles. And I was just hitting the nighttime of the course. So like, you know, pain, hitting the nighttime, not being able to see my crew for another 50 miles. Like it was all weighing down on me. So like I told Sarah that like my back hurts too much. I, I don't care to like, like I finished this race, race twice already. I know I can do it. I don't care to just slog it out just to get a finish. Like my back hurts, so I, I'm done. Um, and she basically, she, she said, no, you're fine. And like tried talking me out of it and I wasn't having it. So so she uh, she hopped in the truck and drove away and <laughs> just left <laughs> me there. Didn't tell me where she was going. Um, but she made it really difficult for me to drop. Um, you know, I got to the next two aid stations uh, would they weren't crewable but there was still those two aid stations before i'd see her again and like i got to all those aid stations and they weren't crewable for a reason like they're hard to get to so like i i got to those aid stations and asked the aid station captain of both of them if i if i was to drop right now how hard would it be to get out of here and like they all gave me the same answer this and, and this was like midnight at one aid station and 3 a.m at the other aid station and both of them were just like you know, if you drop here, we only do like one shuttle out every few hours. So you're going to be stuck here till like one o'clock in the afternoon or whatever. And I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here for 12 hours. That's stupid. So I just kept going. So like, I, I, I would have dropped if, if my wife didn't do that. So having a good crew to, to, to push you and upset you at times is a good, is very essential. <laughs> Yeah, because most wives would uh, want us to take the easy option, and then uh, yeah, if you decide that you're gonna you're gonna drop out, they'll be okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. wow, it's uh, it's good to have someone on your team like that that can that knows you well enough to know that you would probably really regret to have, have dropped at that point, and knows knows you so well that she knows she can push you without it causing major marriage problems. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
just going back to um, music then. So I have that strategy of um, if an ultra is going well, I'll be, I, I've got my music just ready to go. And then when things get tough, I like to put some music on. What, what is your choice of music then for when things get rough? What are you, what do you turn to? Do you turn to something aggressive or is it something relaxing? Um, it's, I'd say it's more aggressive. It's like classic rock era, ACDC, Metallica, nice. um, Leonard Skinner, all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah what about you? Yeah, sim similar. Um, yeah, Metallica is up there, definitely. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm still like a child of the of the 90s, so I'm, I'm having like a bit of a, I'm going back through all of my 90s music again now. I was like really into grunge, like the first time rounds, like all right. of like Soundgarden and Nirvana and and um, and all all the uh, Seattle bands. They were all what I was into, and I was obsessed with when I was sort of in my mid teens, sort of sixteen, fourteen to sixteen. And then I kind of went away from it, and then I've kind of gone back to it again and sort of started to relive my youth. I think it's probably the part of the, the partly to do with getting uh, middle-aged now and I'm into my forties and stuff, <laughs> trying to hang on to my youth. Um, well, some good memories from them. So, uh, but I normally try and find something that will, I've got like a, a playlist on, on, the, on my phone that for when I think it really, but I also use it for like speed workouts as well. So it's mm -hmm. got stuff with deft tones on and uh, something like a bit, bit hard, a bit edgy, just to try and rev me up um, an English mm -hmm. band. There's an English band called um, "Bring Me the Horizon." If you've mm -hmm. ever heard of, them. and they're they're uh, they're quite good. They're running tracks. If you ever want something to to rev you up, but Metallica, yeah, I love Metallica. I've seen Metallica a few times live. Uh, yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Awesome. Um, another question uh, from this is from one of my cl uh, coaching clients, who he's like he's he's just getting into. Uh, a low carb approach and we're trying to we're, we're going through the early stages of it now um but he wants to know uh, if you've ever considered um doing the uh, backyard ultra kind of scenario for a race do you think that that's something that you would have a go at and how would you approach it yeah i was hoping to do it next year but i um uh, do you know maggie guterell yeah so i'm friends with her and i texted her a couple of weeks ago and told her that I wanted to do it next year and if she had any like advice <clears throat> and I guess next year is some weird year where it's not a typical backyard ultra uh, referring to bigs um it's it's more of like a team style backyard I guess you did it a few years ago um but they're doing that again next year so uh, but yes I, I I was hoping you to, to do it next year um and I was going to do it by doing a golden ticket race next year but since Biggs is going to be kind of different I'll, I'm going to wait until 2023 to do it yeah. um but yeah I, I would love to do that sometime and um I haven't thought too much about my strategy about it since uh I haven't thought too much about doing it before now um <clears throat> I mean I imagine yeah I, I don't have a good answer for what my strategy would be because I haven't thought too much about it yet and who knows I think if I about it <laughs> your sort of style of um you know with low carb and going out and at a, a steady pace and being able to have, you've got that proven track record of being able to go really super long and you know it really it would it would that kind of set would you know play to your strengths definitely wouldn't it you think yeah but at the same time one of the things that i think might be play not play like it might be a pretty big big uh hurdle for me um i like a big carrot that i hang in front of myself to to do well at these races is the quicker i finish the more the sooner i can get to my hotel bed <laughs> um <laughs> and I, I i won't be able to hang that carrot in front of me at this at that style of a race so who knows how well i'll be able to mentally dial it back a little bit and like the nice thing about like moab and stuff it's like yeah you have like two terrible quality sleeps um and then you're done and you can go get in a hotel bed but this it's like you don't know how how many terrible sleeps you're gonna have and you don't know how long it's gonna last like 
So I <laughs> think it could be pretty difficult. <laughs> yeah. Imagine you'd probably have like a full week of, of difficult sleeps, wouldn't you? Dragging it out as uh, even further than the record. Yeah. 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 So it could be, it could be, yeah, it could be difficult. And um, just finally, I want to talk about you, you know, the Colorado Trail FKT. Just, you know, I watched the, um, there's a, you know, there's a few videos about it on YouTube, isn't there? Um, what, what, um, what's your takeaway from that? Are you glad that you achieved that? Have you got any more plans to, to not necessarily do that again, but, have, you know, has that experience made you want to try more FKTs or is it just something that you did well? you know, during the pandemic and while well, things weren't as busy with races. Yeah, it definitely made me want to do more FKTs. I, I was actually gonna, I announced it on my Instagram a few months ago. I'm going to have to re-announce that it's not going to happen, but um, I was planning on doing the Appalachian Shell next year. Yeah. And the more I think about it, like one of the things that you, that you probably noticed in that Colorado trail video is that I did not sleep a lot and that necessarily wasn't by choice. Like I tried to sleep, but I couldn't, uh, I ended up sleeping like five total hours during the whole seven day attempt. And the thing with the Colorado trail, um, and this probably sounds silly, but like 485 miles, like is short enough that you can kind of push that boundary with sleep. Um, obviously the Appalachian trail, I wouldn't be able to do that. It's like, if I'm, if I'm getting 45 minutes of sleep a night for 45 days or whatever, like I'm not going to make it 45 days. Um, so I got to figure my sleep out. So I decided that next year I, I am going to go after the Arizona trail FKT. Uh, it is, it's 800 miles and the current record is, uh, last I checked was 12, 12 days and some odd hours. So I feel like that distance is, it's, a, it's across that threshold where I'm going to have to get some good quality sleep to be able to function and finish. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to do the Arizona trail next year, practice my sleep, try to get the FKT and then 2023 go after the Appalachian trail. But I do love the multi-day stuff and until more 200 mile races start popping up, um, you know, the best way to do that is just to go after some long trail FKTs. <laughs> Mm. It does seem like you know 200 is the new 100, isn't it? As far as the size races and over here as well, they're starting to pop up as well. There's like a race series you know, called the Wild Horse 200, where there, there's three three races during the year, um, just across in Wales. I mean, it's still in the UK, but across in Wales, and during the year, there's three separate 200 uh, cool. mile race. It just seems like, uh, but obviously you've got the uh, the the original long distance race in this country anyway, which is the Spine Race, which is two hundred and seventy, and that that happens every that's twice a year now. They do a summer version and a, and a winter version. So, oh, cool. um, yeah, so that's. Uh, have you ever thought about um, coming across the pond and and taking part in any races over here? Yeah, uh, Tour de Gents is on my radar. Um, I I actually got into Tour de Gents this year but I didn't accept just because um, I wasn't sure <clears throat> what the pandemic would be like um, because when I got accepted, it was still kind of, it wasn't in the middle of it all, but it was like, we could see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I just wasn't sure how long that tunnel was going to be. So I deferred or I, I didn't accept just because I'd hate to spend that much money and then the race gets canceled. So Tour de Gents is definitely on my radar, but now the, with the Arizona Trail FKT next year and then Appalachian Trail after that, it might be a couple of years before I try again. Yeah. Buddy ben Light, my buddy Ben Light has done the spine race. He talks a lot about it. It looks pretty brutal. Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's unusual terrain. You're like one minute you're on rocks, the next minute you're, you're up to your waist in peat bog <laughs> and swimming around in brown water. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a very unique um bit of the country I, I only live sort of we were about um an hour's drive away from 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 you know, like the the start of the spine race which is in edale and then the, the race this weekend that i've got actually the the first leg finishes in edale and then the second leg um is from further up and travels back down to edale so uh, 
it's short, very, you know, short, it's only a 50k and then a, a trail marathon the next day, but you, you do get to see like the best of the, the Peak District. So it's, yeah, it's um, especially if you, I know in, in, in the US, a trail run in the US can be different to a trail run in, in Europe. And that's, and even in America, you've got East and West Coast trails that are different, haven't you? So, yeah. And then, and then, and then again, you've got Tour de Gens, and I've heard horror stories about that, but like whether you've got, there's, there's another version of that, isn't there? Is there, there's, um, is there an even longer version of the Tour de Gens? Yeah. yeah where you have a few different ones. Yeah. Where there's like proper ice climbing involved in, in it and everything. So the mind boggles. There's, there's so much, <laughs> the world of ultra running, there's so much to do. So it'll keep anyone busy for a long time. Yeah. But anyway, I'm, I'm aware of um, you know, keeping you for too long because I know you, you're a busy guy. But before we finish, is there any um, anything you want to mention as far as um, how people can get in touch with you? I know you're, you're a coach yourself, aren't you? You've got your own podcast. Um, where's, what's the best place for people to, to catch up with what, you, what you're doing? Just the low carb runner on Instagram and then low carb dash runner.com is my website. Yeah, brilliant. That's two easy ways to do it. Put that into the uh, into the show notes. It's still news to me all this uh, podcasting world. I know you've been doing it for a while and you've been on many podcasts before. So just get into grips with it. Well, I appreciate you, you coming on and sharing your, your knowledge with us today. And, uh, and, and I hope that you have a successful rest of the year uh, and, and for your plans on into next year look forward to seeing the progress and uh, i'll keep my eye, eye out see looking for you and next time you, you're racing and cheer you on I appreciate your time thanks for coming on this morning this afternoon this hey. evening <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks for having me and thanks for being flexible with my schedule <laughs> yeah, no problem no problem thanks mike appreciate your time cheers Bye.